please welcome back to the stage from earlier Professor Jim Al-Khalili and with him Professor Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. There's, there's a, I can still see the queue sort of snaking back there. They should have put us on the main blinking stage, shouldn't they? Yeah! Shall we all just get up and go and... No. So, festival attire, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> um, this afternoon, what we want to do, I mean, this is, this is not an interview, I, I, it's, a, it's a conversation. Richard and I had a quick chat about this earlier, and you know, he would like to ask me some questions as well. But essentially, we're, we want to talk about um, his, his book, A Science in the Soul. Uh, and so I'd sort of been through, and I thought, well, I can get, get a few questions together. But I think we'll just see how it goes. Uh, we'll have a chat. We'll, we, I want to certainly leave enough time for, for as many questions as possible from, from you. Um, so I want, I want to start by saying that when, when I read Richard Dawkins' books, I'm slightly annoyed. Not because there's anything I disagree with, but that, because actually it's a reader, yep, yep, I agree, I agree, I agree. It's because Richard writes in a way that I, so eloquently that I feel, I wish I could have written, said that or written it like that, you know, very, very uh, persuasively. Um, Twitter, different matter. <laughs> but we won't go there. Um, but you, know, Carl, you, know, Carl, you, you quote Carl Sagan's uh, Demon Haunted World, you, you quote people like Bronowski. You know, that, that there's a poetry in writing about science that is, is over and beyond just explaining. You know, science is, is, is hard, and the interesting stuff is actually quite hard to explain. But is there a process you go through in, in rather than just explaining, but trying to put it in a way that you feel you know, has sort of literary value? Well, first of all, one word, trading compliments, for which thank you very much. I didn't realise I'd complimented Richard Dawkins. Uh, oh, um, I had did it, yes. <laughs> um, I, I attended Jim's talk uh, earlier today. I thought it was one of the best science talks I've ever heard in my life. It was terrific. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, as for, as for tricks of the trade for writing, I never know quite what to say when somebody asks me that. I, I've never actually given a lecture on how to write about science, I don't think. Um, the obvious tip is put yourself in the position of the reader. Imagine yourself being the reader as you write. And not just the reader, but lots of different readers. So I, I imagine it being read by all sorts of random people. Maybe somebody who, who just phoned me up and therefore they're in the front of my mind and so I think what would she think about this sentence that I've just just read would she get it would she be confused would she be annoyed how do I change this sentence and so in a way every time I read through my stuff which I do very very often while I'm writing it it goes through a kind of Darwinian process of natural selection and every time I read through it comes out a little bit different because it's been selected is this the next door tent or is this our tent making this noise? I, I, if, it's, if, I, if it's our tent, I'd hope they'd have turned it, it down. Can't, it can't be our tent. Next door. I think we just, yeah, I think we just have to power through. Can people at the back hear us? Okay. Good. There you go. We'll just have to... Somebody said no. That's very perceptive. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it actually, it's more difficult, it's more easy to project when you're giving a lecture than when you're having a, a fireside chat. That, that is true, yes. Quite hard to project when you're talking to somebody who's only a yard well, away. We'll, we'll do our best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, your latest book, Science in the Soul, which is a, a, a collection of, of, of essays and, and lectures think, that you've, you've brought together. But I'm interested in the title. You know, for, for a, a renowned atheist, a lot of people will say, the soul, Richard Dawkins, you believe in a soul. So, where did the title come from and why? Well, that's part of the point. Um, I rather resent the way the religious have hijacked the word soul, hijacked spirituality. You mentioned Carl Sagan a moment ago, uh, Jacob Bronowski is another, where the poetic style of speaking is, is redolent of soul, redolent of spirituality in the non-religious sense. So if you look at the Oxford Dictionary definition of soul, there are 
two different definitions, and one of them is the, the supernatural, the soul that survives your death, that kind of thing. The other one is the, the poetic sensibility, and that's the... the oh. <laughs> um, that's the, the, the Carl Sagan. I think that if Carl Sagan was still alive, he should win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Not for science, but for, but for literature. It's high time a scientist won the Nobel Prize for literature. Absolutely. You were going, I think you said you'd like to read, I mean, on, on the issue of science in the soul, just to read an extract from yeah, the okay. introduction. Um, I can read the uh, introduction to the book. M most of the book, as Jim said, is actually previously published essays, plus a lot of footnotes and endnotes which uh, arise today. But the introduction is new, and it kind of explains what I mean by soul. I'm writing this two days after a breathtaking visit to Arizona's Grand Canyon. Breathtaking still hasn't gone the way of awesome, although I fear it may. To many Native American tribes, the Grand Canyon is a sacred place, site of numerous origin myths from the Havasupai to the Zuni hushed repose of the Hopi dead. If I were forced to choose a religion, that's the kind of religion I could go for. The Grand Canyon confers stature on a religion, outclassing the petty smallness of the Abrahamics, the three squabbling cults which, through historical accident, still afflict the world. In the dark night, I walked out along the south rim of the canyon lay down on a low wall and gazed up at the Milky Way. I was looking back in time, witnessing a scene from a hundred thousand years ago, for that is when the light set out on its long quest to dive through my pupils and spark my retinas. At dawn the following morning, I returned to the spot, shuddered with vertigo as I realized where I had been lying in the dark and looked down towards the canyon's floor. Again, I was gazing into the past, two billion years in this case, back to a time when only microbes stirred sightless beneath the Milky Way. If Hopi souls were sleeping in that majestic hush, they were joined by the rock-bound ghosts of trilobites and crinoids, brachiopods and belemnites, ammonites, even dinosaurs. Was there some point in the mile-long evolutionary progression up the canyon strata when something you could call a soul sprang into existence, like a light suddenly switched on? Or did the soul creep stealthily into the world, a dim thousandth of a soul in a pulsating tube worm, a tenth of a soul in a coelacanth, half a soul in a tarsier, then a typical human soul, eventually a soul on the scale of a Beethoven or a Mandela? Or is it just silly to speak of souls at all? Not silly if you mean something like an overwhelming sense of subjective personal identity. Each one of us knows we possess it, even if, as many modern thinkers aver, it is an illusion. An illusion constructed, as Darwinians might speculate, because a coherent agency of singular purpose helps us to survive. Thank you. Um, throughout this book, Richard, say that the, these are essays written over a number of years. Um, but I think for me the, the unifying theme is uh, very much like Carl Sagan's uh, Demon Haunted World, the last book that Sagan wrote. It's sort of a, a, a battle cry against fuzzy thinking, against irrationality, and sort of a, but at the same time a love story for science. And yes, for science works. yes. Um, Carl Sagan himself said, uh, if you're in love, you want to tell the world. And then he goes on to say, for most of my life I've been in love with science and, and I can't help myself wanting to express my love in a passionate way. So that's part of it, as you say, but it's also, as you say, a battle cry against irrationality. <clears throat> um, it's a beautiful book, if you haven't read it, The, the, the Demon Haunted World. Uh, it is a... Uh, a heart cry against irrationality, against um, homeopathy and telepathy and, and, and water divining and all the things that have no scientific ju justification but which have a kind of 
appeal, almost like the appeal of science fiction, which I love, by the way, but the appeal of the kind of romance of science without the rigor of science. And so he does a beautiful job there. I do strongly recommend his last book. And in my own small way, I've been trying to do the same thing. As you say, it comes through in that book. <coughs> do you think there's more of a call now than ever before? You know, we, we, we live in a world of social media, people shouting ever more loudly. You know, the, the, you get the impression, impression that there are more flat earthers around, flat -earth around today than ever before. Or is that just that they've now found a voice on, on Twitter? Yeah, I, I, I hope it's that they've just found a voice on social media. Um, it is true, I, I think the internet's a wonderful thing, and, uh, and, but, but it is true that although there's a lot of sense on it, a lot of nonsense as well, and so you have to uh, fine-tune your antennae for, for the nonsense as well as for the sense and learn to be critical about it. Critical thinking has always been important, and it's now moved into a new dimension of importance uh, with the ubiquity of social media. It has other consequences as well, like the way in our primitive past we lived in local villages and you just kind of knew everybody in your local village. Now we still kind of live in local villages, but they're internet villages, so you, you're connected with people in the rest of the world who are part of your own internet bubble. Uh, and so it's a, it's a curious kind of meta-village that you're now living in. And we, we seem now to be more aware of this idea of cognitive dissonance, you know, where it, it's <coughs> so hard to change someone's view. If they, if they believe in something or want to believe it, it doesn't matter what logic, what evidence you present to them, yes. they'll stick to it. Well, you and I are both in the business of trying to convince people of, 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 of things, and, and as you say, it is, it is difficult. I really haven't developed any technique apart from just putting it out there. I've been criticized for that as well. I'm uh, lacking the kind of soft soap of persuasion. Um, uh, I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson who, who, who accused me of, of that. So that's not communicating, that's just putting it out there, he said. Um, and I had to, uh, I, I think I said, I gratefully accept the rebuke. Uh, and I think I went on to say, may I quote this, I could quote the um, editor of New Scientist, who was then Alan Anderson. I once asked Alan Anderson what his policy was at New Scientist as editor of New Scientist. And he said, our policy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> I think all the mums and dads of young children are not clapping. <laughs> um, I mean, do you feel, in a sense, that that is your role, that, you know, as your provocateur, or to say something you know is g going to get a reaction because someone has to do it? Well, I wouldn't put it like that, really. I, I genuinely want to be clear, and I, I, I genuinely want to communicate uh, what is, what is known, or, or in some cases what's not known, but, but which we can speculate about. Um, so my, my aim always is clarity. It's also the romance of science, as we're talking about mm. Carl Sagan as well, um, to try to make it poetic. I think there are, well, perhaps you don't agree with this, I think you probably do, um, the, the, the ways in which people try to make science appealing um, I distinguish between, just take an example of the, of the space race, how, how you make that, that appealing. Mm. There's what I call the, the non-stick frying pan approach, yes. which is, the good thing about the space race is that the non-stick frying pan was a byproduct of it. So you make it useful, you, you bring it down to earth, you make it uh, part of everyday life. Same thing about saving the Brazilian rainforest. You save the Brazilian rainforest because you might discover useful new medicines like aspirin from bark. Well, that's all very well, but it demeans science, I think. It suggests that science is only there because it's useful. And I want, I think along with Carl Sagan, and probably along with you, Jim, to emphasize the romance, the artistic aspect, the aesthetic aspect, the poetic aspect of science, looking out at the galaxies, looking inwards at the quantum world, um, and make science like one of the arts make it yeah. appealing in that, in that kind of way, and, and that, that's what I try to do. I, there, there, there's a, a, a quote in your book where you, you, you make this very point about the visionary poetic side of science, science to stir the imagination, as opposed to the non-stick frying pan school of thought. But you, you say, and you say somewhat provocatively, um, uh, you say, a, a tendency I have uh, uh, to compare 
this, you know, the, 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 looking for the usefulness of science only, uh, equivalent to the attempt to justify music as good exercise for the violinist's right arm. That's right, yes. <laughs> Yes, that somehow that's the only use of well, you know, There has to have some practical yeah, application yes, listening yes. to music I'm and playing music. I'm, f- I'm fond of that. And while we're on music, um, I think another way to put it would be to say you can appreciate music, you can enjoy music at a fairly high level without actually being able to play the violin or play other kind other instrument. So many people are put off music because they're made to do five-finger exercises on the piano or something. Um, and And that might put them off appreciating music and, as an aesthetic experience. And you can do the same with science. You don't actually have to know how to use a Bunsen burner in order to appreciate yeah. the poetic, aesthetic value and educational value of science. And are we... I, I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're putting funding into big you know, research projects, whether it's something like, like the work here at George Royal Bank, looking for particles at the Large Hadron Collider, and that costs hundreds of millions of pounds, shouldn't we be putting that money into finding cures for cancer and so on? And sometimes, you know, we have to find the right way of communicating to people that we're doing this because the curiosity defines our yeah. humanity. It's always difficult because in anything that involves money, and there's huge quantities of money in big science, so it's always the case that the more you spend on Peter, the less you have to spend on Paul. And so there is a trade-off, obviously, necessarily. We have to strike a balance. Um, I, I tend towards the, the big science, blue skies, end of that, of that balance, while not neglecting the cure for cancer um, end of the balance as well. Um, I, when I visited the Large Hadron Collider, when I visited great telescopes like on Hawaii and the Canary Islands, I I moved literally to tears by the the beauty of this magnificent, gigantic enterprise that makes me proud to be a member of Homo sapiens, to be doing this this thing. And also my pride in the fact that it's international. You go to a place like CERN and you're surrounded by people talking lots of different languages. They come from all over the world. Same Same with the giant telescopes. Uh, it's, I think it's one of the highest achievements of humanity, al- along with Beethoven and Shakespeare. And I guess a festival like Blue Dot is a good, good evidence for yeah. that. You know, people come here to listen to music. Yeah. Well, what use is that? Well, they're also coming here to, yeah. to listen to the talks about science, and we're not having to explain to them the latest developments in, in technology. Yeah. We're just... Yeah feeding their, their minds with science as well as yes. music. I'm enormously encouraged by the number of people who come to this kind of thing. Well, they're still all queuing up yeah. outside trying to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, uh, in, 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 in the book you talk about science's goal, uh, res- research in science, is to seek a truth. That there's an objective reality out there uh, and we need to, to find it. Um, because my area is quantum physics, it wouldn't necessarily be the case that I would agree with that. I happen to agree with it, but because uh, you know, in quantum mechanics there are various interpretations of what the mathematics means. And for a lot of people, the traditional view of quantum mechanics, which was espoused by people like Niels Bohr and Heisenberg uh, in Copenhagen in the 1920s, is that there is no objective reality, that somehow we bring reality into sharp focus through the act of observing the universe around us, which is a, it's sort of a, a, a philosophical view in the sense that it's, it's, it, 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 it's the way we can do quantum mechanics, the way we can do the calculations. But there are a lot of people who would say, no, there, you know, there isn't one truth, or that there are more ways, different ways of seeing the truth other than science. You can come at it from different directions. I, I mean, we're having a conversation, we're sort of, you know, sort of mutual backslapping, agreeing with each other. But, you know, I have to say that I do agree that there is an objective tr- truth, an objective reality out there. We may never reach it, but we try to get ever closer. Is yeah. that the way yes. you would explain it? Um, we need to unpack that a bit. I mean, I think we're, what we're talking about here is two different aspects of this, there is no, no truth. You're talking about the Niels Bohr point, where in quantum mechanics, uh, you can't actually get at the truth because what the observer does influences what you, what you get, at, get out of it. I mean, the, the um, Schrodinger's cat is, is, is 
neither alive nor dead till you open the box. And, uh, well, the moon isn't there when I'm not looking at it. Well, that, that's, a that's the second point. That's the second point, okay. Um, so, in the Schrodinger's cat case, by the way, a lovely cartoon, you, you probably know it, of, of a, a, vet, a vet's waiting room and people with their dogs in you know, those lampshade things. And the nurse is coming out and saying to one of the people waiting there, about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger, I have some good news and some bad news. <laughs> anyway, so that, 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 that's, that's one aspect, is, yeah. that, is that quantum mechanics is deeply mysterious, and there is a sense in which, in quantum mechanics, um, there, there is no truth. But the other sense is the one, the more philosophical one, where the moon isn't there unless somebody's looking at it. Um, and that I have much less time for. I think that's a kind of human arrogance. Uh, that, you know, the humans haven't been here for that long. And, yes, and, yes. Um, I, and the world, the universe is going to go on being pretty much the way it is now, long after we're extinct. And I, and I have pretty much contempt for the... Uh, for that philosophical thing. Yeah. It was only brought into, into being yeah. when we observed it. Yes. Um, and how about the point about there being more than one truth? You know, that, that science is just one way of looking at the world. Bollocks. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'll, let, let, yeah. let me... I, mean, me I, mean, I have that. to say that the people who applauded you there were some fraction of the audience. Yeah, yeah. There are people who didn't applaud uh, me, who probably let, don't think it's bollocks. Let, let me qualify that. Um, there are important things which I wouldn't actually call truths, but which are important to talk about, like morals, what's right and what's wrong, uh, what's beautiful and what's not beautiful. Those are all things which are, at least not in a proximal sense, not tackleable by science. But in terms of truth about the real world, that's, a, that's the purview of science. I, I'm, I'm aware I want to give lots of time for audience to ask questions, and um, we're sort of coming up to the halfway mark. But I know you said you wanted to quiz me on something oh, about well, biology, so I thought I'd give I, you a chance to ask me. And I I, I'm guessing quite a lot of people here came to Jim's talk this morning, which is fascinating, on, about quantum biology, where uh, he made the point that it's possible that um, quantum effects actually have an effect in biology, especially molecular biology. Um, I wanted to make two points about that. You talked about um, the fact that animals, including European robins, seem to be using a magnetic sense for their uh, orientation. And that magnetic sense could be being mediated by quantum events uh, at, at a molecular level. Um, you probably know that in some cases it's, it is actually more simple than that. Um, I think a lovely experiment done on lobsters, where every time a lobster molts, um, it kind of gets everything re renewed, mm. and lobsters have a sense organ in which there is a grain of sand which is influenced by gravity, and uh, when the, when the um, grain of sand is pointing, if, 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 you put, if you replace the grain of sand with, a, with an iron filing, which you can do when the lobster molts, um, and then you put, put a magnet above the lobster, it turns upside down. <laughs> and the, the, there are magnetic senses in animals which, which are, yes, which are, which yes, are not, yes. um, which are not uh, um, quantum mediated. Um, the other thing more serious I want to ask about was um, there was a book written, I think, in the 1960s by a neurobiologist called Delisle Burns called The Uncertain Nervous System. Well, he was making the point that there are, I think he was talking about statistical mechanical randomness in the nervous system and um, this might be responsible for sort of random events like when you get a new idea, a new inspiration, a new tune comes into the head of a... Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and trying to interpret this in terms of a random event in the nervous system causing a neuron to fire which it wouldn't otherwise have done. Yeah. So. I don't think he was talking about quantum effects, but I imagine you, you might broaden your, your mm. I, ideas to include neuronal firing events, which could be the inspiration for new ideas. Yeah. Well, look, on your first point, about, so I, I talked about, for so the people who weren't in my talk earlier, um, the European robin migrates south from Scandinavia down to the Mediterranean every year in the autumn, and it was discovered in the mid-1970s that it can sense the Earth's magnetic field, which is very weak, 
Uh, but nevertheless, it's able to sense it, and that gives it directional information. And I remember, um, uh, well, I don't remember, but I know at the time, Peter Atkins, um, the chemist, a good, good, good friend of ours, um, accused the, the ornithologists who were pr uh, presenting this idea as charlatans. He said, how can something as weak as the Earth's magnetic field um, influence organisms you know, um, um, and creatures and tell them which way to go? It's so, it's so weak. But, you know, they, they, they found that actually that, that does work. But you're right, there are, there are likely to be other mechanisms that may be at play. Um, homing pigeons are another example. Um, that, that it was, that, that, that we now know they can sense the Earth's magnetic field. And it was thought for some years that they had um, magnetic sort of metallic crystals, possibly in their beaks, that would line up alongside the nerves and that by feeling the direction of the bird in the Earth's magnetic field, these magnetic crystals would move and tweak the nerves and send the signals to the bird's brain. But um, uh, a colleague of mine at UCL, Mark Lithgow, carried out an experiment where he actually put a homing pigeon in an MRI scanner and they studied it and they realized, no, that isn't the mechanism. Yeah. But there may be, there may be other less exotic explanations yeah. than quantum entanglement. Would, would, would you, we use the word exotic, would, would you say that um, other explanations are somehow more parsimonious. Is there any reason to regard the quantum explanation as a last resort, or could you regard it as a first resort? I, I, don't, I don't see it as, as any stranger than any non-quantum no. explanation. No. You know, if, as I said in my talk, you know, life has had long enough on this planet to make use of whatever tricks subject to the laws of physics it can make use of in order to make the process of life more efficient. And if any of those tricks involve reaching down into the quantum domain, nature will have hit upon it. I think that's absolutely right. And there's a thing called Pop's first law, which biologists know, which says natural selection is cleverer than you are. Yes. <laughs> Can I tell you another story yeah. about, about migrating birds? Which, which you, the Jim this, this morning told us about the experiment with the European robins, and the way it was actually done was to put them in a, in a cage, when they, catch them when they're migrating, put them in a cage, a cylindrical cage with a cone-shaped bottom, and the bottom of the cone is ink. And so the birds get ink on their feet, and when they try to get out of the cage, which they do in the direction they're trying to migrate, which might be south towards Spain, then the footprints appear on the side of the cage, showing, and you get a great smear of, of black footprints on, say, the south side of the cage, and very few on the, on the north. That, in, that technique was invented by Stephen Emlin, in Cornell, and he used it for a slightly different purpose, still migrating birds, in this case night-flying buntings. And he was looking at star navigation, mm. using stars. And uh, he had this hypothesis that the buntings were navigating by using the constellations, for example, Polaris, the North Star. Um, and so he put these birds in a cage, with the printing ink and so on, at the, in a planetarium, so you could manipulate the night sky with the planetarium. <laughs> and he brought them up. He actually was, managed to hire the planetarium while he brought these birds up. And so he brought them up from young, youngsters in a planetarium where the night sky in the planetarium did not revolve around the North Star, but revolved around the middle of Orion's belt. And then, when he finally tested them, they treated the middle of Orion's belt as though it was the North Star. In other words, what they were doing was it wasn't that they were born with, their, with their, in their genes a map of the stars. What they were born with was a rule that said, look at the stars every night, look at the one bit of the sky that doesn't rotate as the night goes by, and that's North. And so this brilliant experiment mm. showed that that's exactly what they were doing by actually fooling them into treating the middle of Orion's belt as, as though it yeah. was. And, and far more believable as a, as, a, as a rule that they can inherit that's hardwired in it, their genes. It would be harder to imagine. A map of the whole night sky. That's right, yes. Yeah. I, I've forgotten what the second question was you, are, you were going to ask me, but I thought... Um, I oh, about the Lyle Burns and the, the, the nervous system. Do we, do we have that about um, getting, uh, getting ideas by random quantum... Oh, effects? yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th yeah, I think that's, that's true. That we, There are many processes in biology that may benefit from what's called stochasticity, randomness. Yeah. And it, it, it may be quantum mechanics is at play. There are other sorts, there are other sorts of randis, uh, ra yeah. randomness that may not require quantum mechanics. Well, yeah. And that's the point of quantum biology. It's a very speculative new area. It may turn out not to be as interesting as people think, but we need to 
think about it carefully to, to, to rule it out if, you know, if, it's not, if it's not the correct idea. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Over to you. You, you, you quoted, you oh. quote, you quoted um, Niels Bohr as saying, yes. you think you understand quantum theory. Yes. <laughs> I think it was Feynman said something, said something similar. So if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't yeah. understand yeah, quantum, quantum theory. theory. Yeah. Indeed, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, we're going to open up to the audience. I'm sure there are lots of questions. There's a guy even with two hands up. He's so keen. Um, so the microphones are ready. I... We can't have house lights up so that I can see who's... I can't see where the... Mi oh, the microphones are just coming out now. Fantastic. So, the, the, there's a gentleman there in a quite colourful shirt with two hands up. Uh, and, and then we have a um, couple of hands at the front. And then we'll, we'll move around. We'll try and get through as many as possible. We've got, what, 15 minutes, right? So we'll, we'll do as many as possible. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to bring your two sessions together. Oh, very clever. Channeling um, your theories, uh, it's, it's possible that at this point in time, I might be Richard Hawkins. I, I think I know what that's getting at. Thank you. I'd like uh, to ask you a question, Jim. Right, oh, okay. Uh, many birds fly in many different directions based on a belief that that is the correct direction, based on possibly your assumption that, um, that this new uh, biology thing. Yeah. Uh, emphasis on the word belief there. There's a lot of belief systems, but they also be driven by your theory, such as theological belief systems. The, well, the, the, I mean, the birds... Well, very, first of all, in science, when we use the word believe, we mean something different from... Uh, 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 lack of evidence, faith-based belief. So we, we sometimes use the word belief rather sloppily when we, we maybe should use a different word. But th those birds are, are not doing something consciously. They're, they're subconsciously following something that they've been genetically... They've evolved to do automatically. They're not thinking about what they're doing. Not, they don't have a belief in the right direction to fly. If that's possibly influenced by quantum biology. Well, th but quantum, if it's a quantum effect that's influencing what they do, then that's no different to any other... Uh, physical mechanism or chemical mechanism that any other organism makes use of. To, you know, there's no, uh, you know, DNA doesn't believe it has to replicate itself in a certain way. A, an enzyme doesn't believe it has to speed up a chemical reaction. That they, things are just ha well. This chap's written about this stuff. I mean, did, do you have a succinct answer to, to that? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, that's succinct enough. Well, the, my bumbling attempts is all what we could do, you'll have to make do with, sorry. <laughs> yes? This is a question from Richard. Um, if science is about looking for truth, how does that differ significantly from religion and God? Uh, isn't it obvious? <laughs> um. we, we look for truth using evidence, using evidence that we can actually go out and test experimentally, and I think that is the utterly crucial difference. Right, um, try and, okay, yep, and then we'll move further back. There's a lady about five rows, yeah. Hello, um, this has been brilliant, though. thank you very much. Um, Richard, I wanted to ask, for those recovering from religion and supernatural, um, do you have any advice on that profound shift of looking for purpose as well? Yes, that's, that's a very interesting and difficult question. I think um, you've zeroed in on the more important part, which is the, uh, the feeling of rootlessness, the feeling of being in a, 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 alone in an empty universe where there's no, um, no guiding force. Um, Julia Sweeney, the American comedian, has a very beautiful monologue which she gives on stage. She's an actress and she has a monologue on her uh, really quite long-lasting retreat from Roman Catholicism where she gradually realized that, that, that there was nothing in it. And she has a rather moving part where she hears in her voice, in her head, a little small voice and it begins to whisper and says, there is no God. There is no God. Oh my God, there is no God! And then she says, but then, 
how, how do we go on? I mean, why, why do the planets go on orbiting in their, in their elliptical orbits? And, oh yes, Newton's laws, Kepler's laws. Um, and so she gradually sort of gets to grips with that. Uh, some people find it scary to be alone in the, in the cold wind of reality in, in an empty universe. You can see it the other way around. You can see it as exciting and thrilling and enthralling to, be, uh, to have the power to look out at the universe and say, I'm going to try to understand this. I'm on my own. We're on our own as, as, as humanity. Um, it's, it's, it's something that no other species has ever done. We're privileged to be able to look out and actually understand what this universe is, why we're here, how we came to be here in the first place. I find that exhilarating. I find it an exalting uh, feeling. So I, I, I encourage that way to look at it. The other problem when you're recovering from religion is what you do about your family and your, your grandparents and your uncles and aunts who are shocked. Um, and, and that's a, a very difficult problem and I hear it a lot from people in America who have lost their religious faith but, but do not dare to admit the fact to their families and it's very hard to know how to advise them and, and there's some really rather tragic stories of people being ostracized and cut off by their families because of this. Mm. Humanism! Of course! Hey! <laughs> We're both vice presidents of the yeah. British well, you're Humanist president, UK. Are you? you're, I, I was president, it, but it, it, I, I've, I've stepped down. Yes, yeah. it's a very good idea. That adopts humanism much better. Yes. Hi, um, huge fan of um, by the way, you both. Um, but my question is for Richard. Um, and basically, it stems from the fact that um, a colleague of mine recently, um, when she found out that was an atheist, informed me that I was going to hell. Now, <laughs> which obviously I was like a bit shocked by, but my question for him is um, if you know of any like movements towards workplace recognition of the fact that that, that to me, if, I, if I'd have said anything to her against her religion, it would have been classed as a hate issue. Or, but she, she can quite clearly say that to me, but I have no sort of comeback to it, do you know what I mean? Yes. Um... Well, in a way, that's a carry-on from the previous question. I, I reiterate that it, it is a very difficult problem. I, I mentioned the problem of being ostracized by your family, and you're mentioning the problem of having a friend who actually says you're going to hell. The, the, the doctrine of hell, I think, is, is deeply evil, and, and it's, it's, it's used to intimidate children, and it even intimidates adults. Uh, and um, I, it, I mean, having said it's evil doesn't really help your problem. I mean, I, it would be easy for me to say, choose your friends more carefully. <laughs> but I guess that's not very helpful either. Um, my, my, my way would be calm and patient arguing. Um, where do you get that idea of hell from? Uh, what's the authority for it? Uh, why, do, why do you believe whoever it was who taught you about it in the first place? Maybe a priest, maybe a parent, maybe a teacher. What reason have you got for thinking that they know anything? Uh, and the answer is probably none. Um, so, but calm and patient reasoning is, is one way which I would try, it might not work. I mean, what, what, an, an argument against that is that, you know, they're trying to proselytize and, you know, and tell you that their view is right, that you are wrong. Is it, is the opposite always the best way? Well, I mean, because you talked about calm and, uh, and careful yeah. logical reasoning. They would see that as proselytizing in the opposite Well, direction. they would, but I'm not sure that that's actually right, because I, I, I wasn't saying just you're wrong. I was saying, where did you get that from? You got it from a priest. Where did he get it from? Uh, what is the fundamental authority that the priest had for telling you about hell? Is it based upon anything? Mm. And I think they wouldn't really have an answer to that. My... my uh attitude tends to be sort of indignation if people say you know that you need the re religion to give you the moral guidance or yeah. ethical compass yeah uh, and and if you are not religious then you don't have that and then then I'm I get very cross you know, how dare you assume that if you don't believe yeah. in a supernatural yes. creator you can't be a good person oh, quite and, or, or, and also have you actually read the Bible because if you have don't get your morals from there <laughs> yes Hello, thank you very much for spending your time with us today. Um, I'm interested in knowing how you uh, 
fall on the free will uh, discussion. Uh, in a deterministic universe, and in one where even quantum randomness uh, it doesn't really imbue free will, a choice, uh, is there such a thing? Yes, I, I always hate the free will question. Um, it's, it's, I think it's really a question for Jim Moore. I, I, I rather admire Christopher Hitchens' answer when he gets the question, when he got the question, do you believe in free will? He said, I have no choice. <laughs> See, um, the audience were destined to laugh at that. Yes. It was uh, preordained. I, I think I come down on the side of saying, uh, Yes, free will is an illusion. Uh, everything that I do is determined. However, it's such a powerful illusion that it might as well, you might as well forget about that. Um, we all of us uh, behave as if and believe as if uh, we do have free will. Um, it, it is a separate question, which is a sort of moral question, mm. um, which is if somebody stands up in a court of law who's accused of murder and say, my lad, it wasn't me that did it, it was my quantum fields or my, or my nervous system or yeah. something, do you still punish them? And I think Dan Dennett's view on that would be, it doesn't make any difference whether you, you think you're ultimately determined. If, if punishment has any rationale at all, which might be, say, deterrence or something like that, then it's still there, uh, whether or not uh, you, you, your, your actions are predetermined. Um, and uh, I, I'm not really sure. I think, I think it probably... I don't think we could really run society if we simply said that nobody has any responsibility or blame for anything mm. because their, um, their, their genes or their molecules or their quantum fields or something were responsible. Yeah. I mean, for it's worth, I, 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 I agree. Really, I, yeah, really yeah. answer that. Yeah, no, we, 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 that's my view. We live in a deterministic universe where every, you know, the laws of, of physics will determine cause and effect into the future. Um, and therefore, we don't have free will. Uh, if everything's preordained, but we are unable to predict what the future yeah. would be. We can't see the future unless we could step out of space-time, which is, is it, possible. Is it Therefore, for practical purposes, yeah. that illusion is... is yes, really so, so we agree about that, but I want to ask you a question. Is it still the case, even in the quantum world? Is it, does that make any difference to the deterministic universe? Um, my view is no, because the, the quantum indeterminism, the, the, the true randomness in the quantum world, is constrained to the, to the quantum world, uh, and that once you get to large macro objects, that quantumness decays oh, away. You're a quantum biologist. And then, I, and then I've, and I've just then talked about quantum biology. Quantum mechanics may play a role in biology. And, and if yeah. a quantum event causes a, a mutation, which can affect or mutation the macro, or indeed yeah. nervous system, yeah, so that renders my whole argument obsolete, and, and I have to go away <laughs> and, and think it. Look, free will's a difficult question. <laughs> Hello. Um, my question is, um, it seems to me that nowadays science can change, we can disprove things and prove other things. Do you think that science has existed since the universe has existed and we're just discovering it, or do you think we're creating it? By science, do you mean... Um, I mean, I've heard that question asked about mathematics, for example. So I'm not quite... Because science is a method that we have developed to learn about the universe. So what did you mean? Um, like, uh, the information that we get from schools, per se, the science we learn in schools. The facts. Yeah. That, uh, so is it, are we creating them by putting them into our own language, or are we just discovering them and presenting them with information? Richard, epistemology versus ontology. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose it's true that, to some extent, what we think of as truth is coloured by the way we put it and by the language that we use and by our preconceptions. Um, I uh, have occasionally met people, for example, quite interesting, actually, I, idea that um, uh, in my own field of animal behaviour, it's been suggested that uh, Japanese people approach the study of studying primates, monkeys and apes, in a different way from Western people, and that these two points of view are both valuable. I think they probably are both valuable in different ways in suggesting ideas, suggesting inspiration. But in the second part of the uh, scientific enterprise, when you actually test it against the evidence, I think it should be the same, it should be the same whether you do it in Japan or, 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 or here. Um, but I think it's probably perfectly true that the epistemology 
it interferes, or, or in, in a good way, with the, the inspirational part of science. We have time for just one last question. Sorry, the gentleman right at the front has been waving since the beginning, so we'll, we'll make it quick because we have to wrap up in about a minute. Uh, nice to see you both. Um, do you have, it's a question for both of you, uh, do you have any ethical reservations about the uh, improving ability we have to modify ourselves technologically to make us stronger, better, faster? And is there an argument that it is a, form, a legitimate form of evolution? Yes, that's very interesting. I, I unfortunately had to, to miss most of Kevin Warwick's talk. I imagine maybe that's, that's relevant to what you're, you're saying. Um, I'm not sure ethical is the right word to use. I think maybe um, uh, practical. I, I, I think you, we need to apply the um, precautionary principle to all sorts of things, and this would be among them. Um, is it a, a legitimate form of evolution? Uh, in a loose way of using the word evolution, yes. If you, if you want to apply the word evolution strictly, then it, 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 we're talking about genetic changes in populations as generations go by. So we're not talking about that now. We're talking about something that looks like evolution. And we already have that in the evolution of the car, the mm. computer, and the airplane. But if the human body becomes um, merged in some way with technology in the kind of Kevin Warwick way, uh, then that's a little bit closer to talking about evolution. It's still not genetic yeah, evolution. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, transhumanism is, is, is yeah. a big thing, and, and a lot of people you know, are concerned about it. But more broadly, I think things like genetic engineering um, and artificial intelligence, and so on, the, these are huge areas that are going to transform our world in the coming decades. And, and they're going to happen, but we do need to have those ethical arguments. Just something like gene editing, it's great if we can um, cure sickle cell anemia and various other genetic disorders, but it's not so great if we can then have designer babies and, and, no. and, and choose you know, those yes. attributes. So I think we need to have that dialogue. We need to have it, and I, I would call it the precautionary principle yes. and, yeah. and exercise it very strongly. And we've run out of time. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your questions, Richard Dawkins. <laughs>